Welcome back and we continue with our discussion on postmodernism. Now, uh, we must note that the direct meaning of postmodernism is that uh, postmodernism comes after the modern. You might recall that at the beginning of this class, I had already told you in the, uh, at the beginning of my earlier class, I had told you that we, we need to pay greater attention to the suffixes post p o s t. So, the direct meaning is could be that uh, postmodernism follows modernism therefore, post. However, the post denotes something beyond merely the chronological sequence and denotes a general condition of innovation in technology and also in technologies of art and literature. So, this is important to remember that it is not just a chronological sequ sequence, but it also means a condition of innovation. Postmodernism is the state, condition or period subsequent to that which is modern, particularly in architecture, the arts, literature etcetera. It also entails a departure from modernism and is particularly characterized by a rejection of ideology and theory in favor of a plurality of values and techniques. So, this is the key uh, concept here. Um, we have been talking about Lyota, Jean Francois Lyota. For him, the postmodern world would be that which uh, in, uh, in the modern puts forward the unpresentable in presentation itself, that which denies itself the solace of good forms. Now, here I would like to draw your attention to this extensive quote from Lyotas postmodern condition. I have said that narrative knowledge does not give priority to the question of its own legitimation and that it certifies itself in the pragmatics of its own transmission without having recourse to argumentation and proof. The scientist questions the validity of narrative statements and concludes that they are never subject to argumentation or proof. He classifies them as belonging to a different mentality, savage, primitive, underdeveloped, backward, alienated, composed of opinions, customs, authority, prejudice, ignorance, ideology. This unequal relationship is an intrinsic effect of the rules specific to each game. We all know its symptoms. It is the entire history of cultural imperialism from the dawn of western civilization. It is important to recognize its special tenor which sets it apart from all other forms of imperialism. It is governed by the demand for legitimation. For Brian McHale, postmodernism precedes the consolidation of modernism. It is modernism with the anomalous avant-garde still left in and makes itself available for a later consolidation of the next phase and this process is constant. But again according to McHale, this operation of constructing modernism by cutting it in half is not the only tendency in the recent literary historiography of modernism there is also an opposing tendency towards the assimilation of the whole of modernism to its avant-garde half and thus towards assimilating modernism to postmodernism. So, basically he talks about the assimilation, the overlaps of modernism and postmodernism and this is something that you might have noticed when you read select texts uh, of so called modernism and select texts from um, the so called postmodernist period and you will find how they assimilate and how one feeds on the other. Um, some more theorists, so they are Ahab Hassan, Charles Jenks, Linda Hutchin and of course, Brian uh, McHale and Lyotard we have been talking about frequently and like them many other scholars attempted to describe the stylistic hallmarks of postmodernism. We have already been talking about a number of stylistic hallmarks and features of postmodernism. 
there was an increasing concern with the images in circulation in the culture and their recording, reuse and recycling in art. Now, we have to remember that unlike the heroic modernists who created works out of pure imagination, the postmodern artist works with cultural givens trying to manipulate them in various ways. For example, parody, pastiche, collage, juxtaposition for various ends and this is something that we have been seeing in detail throughout the course. Now, uh, according to Frederick Jameson um, in uh, his uh, postmodernism or the cultural logic of late capitalism published in 1991, he gives us some uh, uh, major aesthetic features of postmodernism. Um, he talks about the erosion of the distinction between high and low culture, this is extremely important erosion of distinction between. So, there are no more boundaries unlike the modern is breaking down of boundaries between different genres of writing. So, uh, genre defying is one key feature of postmodernism. Uh, within the same text as we have been seeing A. S. Byatt's position or John Fowles, the French lieutenant's woman, we can see uh, uh, that uh, the boundaries are broken down in different genres of writing. Postmodernist artists cannot invent new perspectives according to Jameson and new modes of expression. Instead, they, cre uh, they operate as bricolas and if you may recall, in one of our earlier, earlier classes, we had already talked about the concept of bricolage that is recycling previous works and styles. So, pastiche, bricolage, intertextuality, parody, all these you know, you know you're taking all these forms and creating a new whole from something that already exists. So, uh, resisting creating something altogether new, but rather depending on something that already exists. So, pastiche is a parody that has lost its sense of humor according to Jameson and then Jameson also talks about the incorporation of material from other texts. Now, uh, to continue with Jameson, he sees the reliance on the styles of the past as an indication of the particular kind of nostalgia. Nostalgia is a key feature, key element of postmodernist discussion by Frederick Jameson and uh, he sees it as one of the defining characteristics of postmodern art and he says random cannibalization of all the styles of the past reduces the past to a series of spectacles a collection of images disconnected from any genuine sense of historical process. Jameson also talks about the psychic fragmentation or schizophrenia, you know schizophrenia having sort of uh, uh, blurring of identities or fragmented identities uh, which he elaborates as an experience of the isolated disconnected discontinuous material signifiers which fail to link into a coherent sequence. The schizophrenic does not know personal identity in our sense. For Jameson, the postmodern has two main characteristics. Firstly, he believes that the postmodern is directly influenced by the negation of its previous epoch, modernism and in order for something to be postmodern it emerges as a specific reaction against established forms of high modernism. This means that there will be as many different forms of postmodernism as there were high modernisms in place since the former are at least initially specific and local reactions against those models. And secondly, a key feature of postmodernism is that the lines between high and popular culture are gone or at least beginning to fade. This on incorporation of high and mass culture can also be seen in other areas of discourse from philosophy to literature, where normal discourse theory has been replaced by a kind of writing simply called theory, which is all 
uh, or none of those things at once. Jameson considers this phenomenon which he calls theoretical discourse to be a sign of postmodernism and an example of the merging cultures. Another major characteristic of the postmodernist thought and condition is unfinalizability. It is defined as the opposite of closure and an integral aspect of um, Bakhtin's ideas according to which it is impossible to have the last word. No one can have the last word anymore. No one can have the final word and have closure anymore. Nothing conclusive has yet taken place in the world. The ultimate word of the world and about the world has not yet been spoken according to Bakhtin. The world is open and free, everything is still in the future and will always be in the future. Texts with multiple perspectives reflect the non-closure of and lack of finality of human motivation. Um, a major theorist of a postmodern uh, thought is uh, Ihab Hassan, who wrote the seminal The Dismemberment of Orpheus, published in 1971. So, the title invokes the image of Orpheus, the divine singer, torn to pieces in Hades as he looks for his wife Eurydice, but whose head continues singing, his, uh, although his lyre is broken into 100 pieces by his side. Now, why use uh, such kind of an imagery as at the title of your book. So, uh, for Hassan, um, modernism was essentially rational unlike the heroic modernists who can created work out of imagination, the postmodern artists given with uh, or work with cultural givens. So, therefore, Ehab Hassan gives us a list of modernism and postmodernism. Um, and here is a list I would like to draw your attention to it. So, this is Hassan's list. Modernism and postmodernism, the one on the left is uh, uh, are the features of modernism, and on one on the right are the characteristics of postmodernism. You may take a look. Romantic uh, modernism is romantic, whereas postmodern is, is Dadaist. Modernism is, has form, postmodernism does not have a form. Modernism has purpose. Postmodernism has a sense of play, modernism has design, postmodernism works on chance, modernism is characterized by hierarchy, whereas for Hassan, postmodernism is characterized by anarchy, anarchy. Modernism has a logos, has logos, believes in words, postmodernism believes in silence, modernism believes in mastery and postmodernism believes in exhaustion. You may refer to John Barth's seminal essay, Literature of Exhaustion. Modernism talks of finished work and postmodernism talks about performance and happening. Modernism is about distance, postmodernism about participation, more mixing, carnivalesque. Modernism is about totalization postmodernism is about decreation and deconstruction, modernism is about synthesis, postmodernism antithesis. There is presence, centering and genre and paradigm and hypotaxis in modernism, there is absence, dispersal, intertextuality, syntam and parataxics that is short simple sentences in postmodernism. Modernism thrives on metaphor selection, root, interpretation, signified, lisible that is readerly and grand history and grand narrative, postmodernism thrives on metonymy, combination, rhizome against interpretation which is also the title of Susan Sontag's work, misreading, signifier, writerly and petty history, petty is tua and is anti narrative. Again this is the last slide, modernism thrives on master code, symptom, phallic, paranoia and origin, whereas postmodernism 
derives from idiolect, desire, androgyny, and is more polymorphous rather than phallic centric. It is schizophrenic rather than paranoid and thrives on difference and difference. Again, modernism is about metaphysics, determinacy, and transcendence. Postmodernism plays on irony, indeterminacy, and immanence. Now, um, Simon Malpas in the postmodern talks about um, the definition and he tries to interpret the postmodern condition, where he says postmodernity marks the transformation that has taken place in society during the last few decades with the rise of new forms of capitalism, the development of communication technology such as the internet, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of voices from different cultures to disrupt the traditional white male. So, multi ethnicity, multi um, cultural, culturalism those are the features that postmodernism plays on okay, rather than um, uh, accepting the traditional hegemony of the traditional white male. So, therefore, we are we go back to our premise that post in postmodernism is not just about a chronological historical sequence, it is more much more than that. Um, I will take you to another uh, quotation by another great uh, postmodernist thinker Jean Baudrula and his the Gulf war did not take place po, uh, published in 95. Now, here is what he says, Americans can only imagine and combat an enemy in their own image, they are at once more missionaries and converts of their own way of life, which they triumphantly project onto the world. They cannot imagine the other, nor therefore make war upon it. What they make war upon is the um, alterity of the other, and what they want is to reduce that alterity, to convert it, or failing that, to annihilate, annihilate it um, if it proves irreducible. For example, the Indians, and then a second quotation this is the rule of the American way of life, nothing personal, and they make war in the same manner pragmatically and not symbolically. Badrilo wrote this piece concerning the first Gulf War in 1990 to 1991. The thrust of the piece is the difference between modern day warfare and the battles of the past. The idea of the work emerged out of his concern with the notions of simulation and simulacra. We have already seen that. Badrilo observes that the Gulf War was fought from afar as important decisions were made in Pentagon boardrooms. Information was sourced from maps and satellites, images and military strategists gave advice without even ever visiting the Middle East. Again, targets for air strikes were located from cockpits using computer screens. Bodrila questions how we know that the war in the Gulf ever took place when there was no actual contact with the enemy. The coalition army fought the war the way we play interactive games on our personal computers and other video games. Baudrillo also turns his attention to the media and its role in the invasion. He observes that the sensationalist style of reporting was akin to the spectacle seen in mainstream film productions, you know the blockbuster kind of films, where you have all these great war scenes. So, it almost felt like watching a movie, a great spectacle, it not just a real war and also understand the way um, or the number of uh, Iraqi civilians and Iraqi soldiers uh, uh, were killed in this war, whereas the number of ca casualty on the coalition side was much more um, uh, fewer. So, we uh, where is the comparison that is the question, he also commented on the way the television images of the Gulf war were heavily edited for effect that they bore to resemblance to the actual event. So, an edited war, 
okay, a, a kind of war where um, um, images were projected and screened for popular mass consumption um, and to make people see what the coalition forces, the superpowers wanted to see. So, again proving the thesis that the war was a simulation. Now, Habermas is a German sociologist and philosopher, he is also well known for his critique of postmodernism. He suggests that the term postmodernity indicates a failure in modernity and speaks for modernity, which still has credentials intact as a way of understanding culture. The avant-garde understands itself as invading unknown territory, exposing itself to the dangers of sudden, shocking encounters, conquering an uh, as yet unoccupied feature, future, the avant-garde must find a direction in a landscape from, um, into which no one seems to have yet ventured, which and this is what Habermas says in Modernity versus Postmodernity, an essay published in 1981. So, to sum up what are the characteristic features of postmodernism? It is a literal and cultural phenomenon characterized, characterized by delegitimation and de-differentiation. It leads to indeterminacy and erosion of authority. It thrives on fragmented narrative style, it has non-linear narrative. It has hyperlink or parallel stories, short stories running parallel to each other. It is characterized by schizophrenia and is marked by fluidity of identity. It the structurally it is more intertextual and is full of illusion and pastish. It encour encourages multiple readings and uh, encourages anarchy. Postmodern is um, challenge the distinction between high and low culture, they reject grand narratives and question um, originality. They propose that reality is replaced by simulation, that is what Baudrilla tells us and supports the structures of intertextuality, hybridity and non-linearity. Some of the great postmodern novels of our times are The Unnameable by Samuel Beckett, um, uh, House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski, Slaughterhouse 5 by Kurt Vonnegut. Labyrinth by George Bure, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, Naked Lunch by William Burrow. Some of the postmodernist films that resist closure are Pulp Fiction, The Blade Runner, Natural Born Killers, Inception, uh, many works from contemporary Iranian cinema and also uh, contemporary Chinese cinema, particularly the films uh, directed by Wong Kar Wai. Now, here is, uh, uh, here is your bibliography, please take a quick look at it. Thank you very much. <laughs>